Welcome, everybody. I have to welcome more than 170 participants from all over the world. So I'm really happy to meet all of you here virtually. My name is Frank Petzold. I'm working with Fraunhofer IFAM in Bremen uh, in the position of the Deputy Director and Head of the Powder Technology Group. So I'm really happy to meet all of you today uh, as we have the obviously very interesting topic. Some of you may remember that we started to discuss about Sinter-based additive manufacturing technologies in the year 2019, before all these pandemic situations started. So there we planned to have an next meeting, which unfortunately had to be postponed twice already now. Therefore, we decided to have today a free webinar on Sinter-based additive manufacturing with actually three speakers. So three speakers from Fraunhofer IFAM. First of all, I would like to introduce uh, Klaus Armon Kopp. Some of you may know him as the chairman of the Euro uh, Group for Additive Manufacturing. The second speaker will be Bastian Bartel. Bastian is our specialist for binder jetting and materials. And uh, third speaker is Sebastian Hein. Sebastian is uh, senior in the institute working on functional materials but also on shaping technologies and this topic will be on other sinter based additive manufacturing processes than metal injection uh, metal binder jetting so i would like to announce that uh, if you have some questions you have the function in the system uh, teams live to Put your questions in the Q&A section and we will have after every talk the chance to discuss briefly about your questions and give hopefully the answers. So let's start with the first presentation and uh, I would like to hand over to Klaus Armenkopp for his presentation. Klaus, it's your turn. Thank you, Frank. I'm just uh, sharing my presentation here. Hope everybody can see it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, also, a warm welcome from my side here in um, Germany and to everybody listening around the globe. Um, my presentation is headlined Sinter-based AM at Fraunhofer IFAM. Um, I will concentrate uh, on binder jetting later on and um, I will introduce the uh, activities considering additive manufacturing here at Fraunhofer IFAM in Bremen and um, give you an overview of what we are doing. So first of all, uh, the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, uh, the Fraunhofer Society um, is a society um, of uh, 74 institutes. Meanwhile, more than 28,000 employees uh, all over Germany, R&D volume of 2.8 billion euro. And uh, Fraunhofer IFAM is one of the bigger institutes within uh, Fraunhofer Society uh, and our headquarter is located in Bremen. Uh, we here at IFAM have about uh, 700 uh, employees and a total budget uh, in, 19, uh, in 2019 of uh, more than 50 million euro. So uh, on the upper right you can see our two directors uh, Matthias Busse and uh, Bernd Meyer. Uh, Matthias Busse is the executive director uh, leading the institute together with Bernd Meyer. And uh, as already mentioned, Bremen is the headquarter of our institute. Uh, we have uh, more than 100 uh, colleagues uh, located in, in Dresden also. We are located with um, some colleagues uh, next to Airbus, close to Hamburg. Uh, the town is called Stade. 
where we uh, concentrate on handling and production of uh, carbon fiber reinforced materials. We are working in Braunschweig and uh, Wolfsburg, close to a famous German car manufacturer. And uh, last but not least, we are located with uh, a test center on the uh, only German high sea island, uh, which named uh, is named Helgoland. So we are spread uh, all over Germany, but we are concentrated here in Bremen and uh, the things we are talking about today are concentrated here in Bremen. This is a uh, view of the uh, Bremen University area and uh, the uh, red marked area is uh, where the Fraunhofer IFM is located. Just to give you an impression, some of you might uh, know the, the drop tower in uh, the upper left of the picture. So we are close to Bremen University, working closely together with uh, many institutes here in Bremen, many companies uh, like Bego or Materialize. And um, this is a good environment for additive. Coming back to the organizational structure of uh, IFM itself. So we are part of the shaping and functional materials branch of the Institute. Um, our development focus is uh, materials, production of precision, uh, precision parts and components, production in integration um, and uh, energy systems and electro mobility. This is all led uh, by Professor Busse and going a bit deeper into the powder technology department uh, where all additive um, activities are located in. Um, there we do things like uh, powder compaction, metal injection molding, where we are all also very famous for. We are doing this uh, for uh, several decades, meanwhile, and uh, started in the uh, early 1990s already with additive manufacturing uh, technologies. At that time, it was uh, laser based uh, 3D printing. This has developed into more technologies. Um, this uh, slide gives you a rough overview of what we are doing in total at Fraunhofer IFAM. So we are not limited to the uh, Sinter based AM technologies only. We also uh, run uh, systems uh, for the um, laser powder bed fusion processes or uh, laser beam melting, uh, you might still call it. Uh, colleagues in Dresden are running systems for electron beam melting and are very successful using this technology to develop new materials and to develop the processes further. Um, binder jetting, of course, is uh, a topic we have been doing for more than two decades. Meanwhile, we started in the early or in the in the late 1990s already. Um, then the market didn't develop in a way um, to um, go on with this technology, so we stopped it a few years, but uh, some years ago reinvested into new uh, printers, into new machinery, machinery, and are back again with metal binder jetting. Another technology is the so-called so uh, 3D screen printing, also located in Dresden. A very special technology for, for high precise, but uh, very small parts, but capable of mass production. Uh, fused filament fabrication is another center based technology we are dealing with. Mold jet system is the latest um, investment we made um, at Fraunhofer IFAM. Gale casting or gel casting is uh, complementing this uh, set of uh, technologies. 
and uh, Sebastian will, will give more insights into that later on. All these technologies are supported and accompanied, of course, by powder quality testing. So powder as the raw material for the processes is a big uh, or takes a, a lot of, of our capacity to, to deal with and to uh, look into the powder quality very deeply. This slide gives you an impression of our metal binder jetting systems and um, the um, accompanying uh, technologies and accompanying equipment we use. So we have, um, or we are lucky to have a, an X125 Pro in the Institute. Some more details later on and impressions. We are working with two Innovant uh, Plus systems. Uh, one is equipped with the uh, advanced uh, coating technology, the so-called ACT. And we have an, an older one, the, the simple Innovant system, uh, which is also still uh, being used, uh, especially for material um, development. And uh, Binder jetting is nothing without uh, being able to do the debindering and sintering step. So also there, the Institute is well equipped with two Elnik sintering ovens. Um, you can see the sizes and uh, the diff different um, possibilities we have here on the slide. Additional uh, sintering ovens uh, are part of our uh, sintering lab. Uh, or oven laboratory and of course a lot of equipment for metal powder uh, qualifications and things like that. So I've been talking about the uh, 25 Pro system. So this is the one which is uh, now here in Bremen uh, installed in our lab. Uh, an envelope of, of 400 by 250 by 250 uh, millimeters as a build envelope. This gives us 25 liters of build volume. So much, much bigger than the small innovants, which have uh, slightly one and a half liters build volume. Those are excellent for material development, but this 25 Pro is now the next step into real production, I would call it. So on this system, we are going to um, yeah, look what the machine uh, really does. Um, it is um, said to be able to uh, have a build rate of uh, more than three and a half liters um, per hour. We will uh, test those uh, figures. We are running uh, different materials. We are looking into the limits and the specialties of the systems, but we are happy to have this system here to uh, yeah, offer industry or other partners um, cooperation in the further development of binder jetting. Another impression of the inside uh, of the system. So this is um, my colleague or our colleague um, checking the setup of the build envelope and uh, the print head and um, this slide gives you an impression of the so-called depowdering station which is also delivered together with the system so the whole build envelope or the whole build box is taken out of the machine uh, can be depowdered uh, or the parts can be depowdered externally, can then be handled for curing and the uh, subsequent uh, thermal treatment steps. And the printer can be equipped with the second build box and can go on printing. So this is possible with this kind of, of set, setup of separated printer and depowdering station. Okay. What are we doing here at IFAM? This slide uh, shows an overview of our core competencies related to binder jetting. So we 
start quite classically with uh, CAD data, uh, where we know, uh, of course, what um, metal binder jetting parts should look like to make them printable and uh, sintrable in the end. We um, know and have learned during the last years a lot of uh, the powder bed deposition issues like uh, or characteristics like powder flow, particle packing, uh, process stability, repeatability and, and robustness. Um, of course, the, the material selection in general, where um, Bastian will give some more insights later on. We uh, have been looking into the binder uh, agent applications and uh, their specialties, so binder particle interactions, uh, different binding systems, curing questions have been answered, and uh, we have tested uh, a lot of different binders. Next step is the depowdering after the printing of the green part, of course, and um, also their green part handling. Uh, automation of this depowdering is uh, still an open or fairly open question where we look into. And then starting with the thermal treatment, first step is the debinding. So uh, also their temperature, time profiles, atmosphere play a big role. And the sintering um, in the very end uh, is also related to um, those um, environmental specialties. Um, just to give you an impression uh, about uh, powder uh, quality control, so there we look very deeply into uh, particle size distributions, for example. We work with uh, systems like the uh, CAMSizer, which gives us uh, particle size distribution and at the same time powder morphology, which both are very uh, important and very closely related to powder flowability and in this respect to coatability and recoatability of the powder bed. Design I already mentioned, so we really teach people and tell people to design for functionality and uh, to use the uh, freedom of design they have with binder jetting and process and material um, uh, where Bastian will give us more uh, insights into are also uh, topics we will look into. Powder competence is always vital for these powder bed based processes like binder jetting. So there we use all the standard test uh, equipment and standard test methods. We have been using with our classical powder metallurgy um, technologies like MIM, like uh, classical sintering. But we have learned quite quickly that um, with additive, you sometimes need more precise uh, figures on flowability, for, for example. And um, if you look uh, on the uh, lower left, you see this um, test set up for this classical um, uh, funnel flow test, which is standardized and has been standardized for decades, but uh, which doesn't work for the fine powders we use with additive technologies. So we have invested into new methods like uh, described here in the middle, the rotating drum tests. Here we use the um, mercury revolution powder analyzer, which uh, simply takes um, pictures of the powder during powder um, flowability or, or during powder movement. So very close to the uh, processes which appear during AM processes, at least those which are powder bed based. And with this uh, rotating drum approach, uh, we have um, developed uh, a thing we call um, uh, powder fingerprint together with data from the um, chem sizing system. We can really deeply dig into the powder questions and flowability questions. The uh, cam sizer is um, represented here on the uh, lower right and putting all these results together 
we are developing quality concepts and concepts for inline measurements of powder as one vital aspect of all the powder bed based technologies, of course. As we are talking about sinter based AM, sintering um, is, of course, uh, the final step of, of all these processes, and sintering is a special thing. It's a uh, it's a uh, diffusion based process and uh, during sintering the um, parts or the green parts uh, change their behavior in a way that you sometimes lose uh, ge geome uh, geometrical um, accuracy. Um, and of course, there you have to find solutions. And also this is something we have been doing for decades, finding solutions to handle these complex parts uh, during um, debinding and sintering, uh, preventing them from uh, warpage, uh, calculating the shrinkage and uh, handling those parts and setting those parts inside the sintering oven in a way that uh, we end up with um, high quality parts. So also there we do have a lot of experience and um, are still learning a lot, but um, in this case metal binder jetting is, is very close to the technologies we know and it's it's the, the right step into this technologies uh, technology uh, combining those experiences and new insights. And sintering as a keyword, um, we um, have been testing a lot of different powder mixtures, um, powder uh, powders with uh, different particle size distributions, and uh, with um, sintering, you always want to have very fine powders to activate them or to have the, the maximum of sintering um, activity. Um, so with fine powders, the sintering activity becomes bigger. Um, on the other hand, you might see um, problems um, or at least challenges with uh, powder handling, powder uh, distribution and recoating during the process. So um, it's always a trade off between the different powder characteristics. Uh, and uh, our job is and has been to find the right powder for the right process or uh, to say it in other words, to to um, adapt the process parameters in a way that all powders can be handled uh, for sinter based additive manufacturing, in this case, metal binder jetting. Doing this, you have to consider, of course, the different aspects of the whole process chain. Uh, so powder stands in, in the middle, of course, as um, the raw material for the process. The recoating um, step is in influenced by the powder and has a big influence on the process robustness and of course on the process speed. It's obvious uh, the um, higher the velocity during recoating is, the more time um, you, uh, the, the less time you need for this recoating step and save a lot of time during the uh, process. And as we are working with with the layer thicknesses of, of 20 or 30 microns, each um, millimeter takes you up to 15, uh, 50 layers and 50 recoating steps. And every tenth of a second, uh, which uh, can be saved in this step, is of course helpful in the end. Um, Depowdering, I already mentioned that, is uh, not automated uh, at all, I would say it. There are approaches uh, at some uh, companies and institutes, but also this is under development and of course uh, plays a big role in the whole process chain. 
and uh, sintering in the end um, makes uh, or has the the big or has uh, also a very big influence on the part properties uh, properties and uh, here distortion is a big challenge preventing um, parts from being distorted. Um, so all the powder properties must be taken into account in the design of the process and the parts and um, powder quality management is crucial for mass production. So this is the reason why we, when we look at all the center based uh, technologies, we always look very deeply into powder quality. Um, working together with us uh, is uh, easy and we invite you to do that, of course. Our focus is understanding the complexity of process change and their uh, dependencies. So our motto is from powder to part. This is what we want to uh, uh, solve in, in total. And our offers you can take from, from the slide. So material and process development, process uh, data acquisition, correlation, interpretation, plays a, a, a bigger and bigger role in industrial production these days. We analyze the processes and, and parts very deeply. Um, we support quality assurance for your processes and we tr train you and educate you on these processes. And uh, the next uh, possibility to do this uh, after this seminar is uh, the already announced workshop. Frank Petzold announced it uh, at the very beginning and um, yeah, will take place on uh, September 15th and 16th um, here in Bremen, hopefully in person. So please frequently check our event page and uh, thank you for listening and uh, I'm open for questions after my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank okay, you, Klaus. Thanks. That is a very nice presentation. So uh, we have a lot of questions in okay. the Q and A session here. So I'm quite sure I cannot uh, give all the questions to you right now and to answer all the questions, as it's so many. And uh, well, I have to select a little bit. Of course. So for all of you who are sending questions, uh, please, if we don't can, if we do not answer all your questions right now, please contact us after the webinar. Send us an email. We give you the contact data later on. Please come in touch. But some of the questions we can definitely address. So, um, Klaus, maybe we can start with uh, a question on uh, debindering and sintering. The question is whether it takes place in the same furnace, or do we need some equipment, some special equipment for debindering? No, usually we don't. So, at least with um, what we know from from binder jetting, um, which I was focusing on. This can take place in the same furnace. We do not need a uh, different furnace equipment. If you do it the right way, it can be done in one thermal treatment step. Okay. Um, another question is addressing all these topics around simulation. So how do we treat simulation already in the design phase of a component and later on also in the sintering phase, debinary phase, what are the capabilities to make the, uh, well, the production reliable by using simulation? So sim simulation, in fact, is concerning sintering and debinding is at its very beginning, I would call it. There are approaches, um, all around, so Desktop Metal has published uh, some approaches on uh, sintering simulation, for example. Um, other institutes are, are working on that. We ourselves are working together with colleagues here from Bremen uh, 
uh, in publicly funded projects on the topic of uh, simulating at least um, shrinkage, warpage, distortion during debinding and sintering. But what we don't have at the moment are um, completely developed uh, software products you could easily integrate into your CAD world, for example. This is not state of the art yet. So a lot um, of work is ongoing on the topic of simulation, but not uh, as far uh, developed as we might know it from, from uh, conventional machining systems. But yeah, we are working on that. Maybe Klaus, one more question related to the um, depowdering. So you were addressing depowdering. Uh, the question is whether in a serious production it can be done automatically or do we have some semi-automatic depowdering device or how do we handle that? Um, of course, this should be the, the final goal to have this automated completely for serious uh, production in the end. Um, also, there a lot of work is ongoing. We we have seen uh, developments from uh, Digital Metal from Sweden, for example, who have uh, programmed a robot to first um, blow away the powder um, from from the uh, green parts um, smoothly, and then picking the parts uh, onto a, another tray um, or s similar approaches. Um, yeah, the depowdering and automation of depowdering will definitely be one of the, the key success factors we, we need for the process. But I'm sure this uh, can be solved. Automation is, is capable of, of also handling these green parts. It always uh, is related to green part strength, green parts uh, stability, so the green parts have to be handleable. But uh, we see this from from MIM industry where it is state of the art and uh, I'm quite sure that we will be able to um, develop automation uh, for the center based uh, AM technologies um, to a status which can uh, definitely uh, be compared to to standard handling of, of parts, metal parts. Yeah. OK, I see there are many other uh, questions here. As I already mentioned, it's uh, absolutely not possible to answer all of them. But I would like to address two more questions. So next question is what uh, and when will be the 25 Pro system available for external requests? Well, requests are, are um, possible any time. So we are, we are happy to, to talk to you to uh, discover the, the possibilities together. We are open to, to work together with you. And maybe the last question for you right now in this uh, for this presentation. So um, is there certainly some industry which is more interesting for binder jetting than other industries? Like for example, the medical industry or the defense industry or uh, is there any special industry which you would like to mention? So we, we have uh, seen and, and uh, learned a lot of interest from, from the automotive industry, not for the real mass production, but simply to fill the gap between, let's say, uh, a thousand parts a year, which you could do with uh, laser or other beam-based uh, technologies, and a uh, hundred thousand parts per year um, where you can um, economically uh, step in with, with uh, tool-based um, production technologies. So we see uh, still see binder jetting as the technology which is able to fill this gap between thousand and hundred uh, thousand parts a year. And um, yeah, it's, it's um, you mentioned it, medical industry, it's automotive. Um, I'm sure there will be other industries. Um, there is a lot of interest due to the uh, 
the 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 uh, advantages binder jetting offers. Okay, thank you very much, Klaus, for your answers and for the presentation. Uh, once again, uh, we have to apologize that we cannot answer all your questions. Please <laughs> take the chance to get in touch with us, and we will definitely answer all your questions. So I would like to switch over to the second presentation, and the second presentation is given by Bastian Bartel. Bastian will concentrate on the material aspects, the material aspects, especially for metal binder jetting. Bastian, the floor is yours. So welcome to my presentation on materials for metal binder jetting. I will give you an overview of what materials are already in the market and show you some of our activities. Um, then I will show you how we develop the process for different materials and what has to be taken into account along the whole process chain, especially on an example of A11 tool seal and subsequently give you an outlook on the transferability of the developments um, to other center based AM processes. So first of all, there are a couple of materials out already in the market, already published. Um, it all starts with stainless steel, 316L, 174PH, and not so common for 20 stainless steel and metincitic stainless steel. Um, that's been also the steels we are doing mostly our process development on, as you can get it in every particle size distribution and morphology. As the automotive industry um, and other industries are not just dealing with stainless steels, um, more of um, yeah, low alloy steels that can be hardened 4340 as well as 4140 and um, yeah, 8620 are interesting materials. And especially for binding jetting or for sinter based additive manufacturing, tool seals are interesting because they cannot be processed, or not all at least, with other AM technologies. Titanium is already in the market as well. Digital Metal has it, um, and you can purchase already your parts. And then there are also nickel based super alloys. We did some yeah, tests in Inconel 7 and um, 718 and 713. Um, Inconel 620 as the two below are also available. So for titanium 64, we had a pretty nice microstructure and the microstructure was comparable to um, those what we got in metal injection molding and in 718 as already mentioned was one of our yeah points and materials we looked at in the very beginning this was a project with the aircraft industries when they yeah had to look at especially this material because they could compare it to their already established processes so next of the materials um, are yeah, one of more special materials. So as you already noticed, there have been a lot of news in the last couple of months concerning aluminum. As we are also working on this topic for sure, um, these are yeah, micro, the micro section of some investigations last year of uh, a master thesis and we we had a dense core in the beginning and um, a porous shell, but um, as time yeah goes on, we progressed and I guess our actual results are really promising. But I can't go into yeah deeper into it. Other materials we looked into, or we looked at, were cobalt alloys as well as copper, and a lot of function materials. Um, as Frank already mentioned, Sebastian is doing a lot of tests um, as well as Sandra in our group or in, in our department. Hard materials can also be processed with binding jetting 
but not in our house. We did more research on metal ceramic composites. Uh, one example is uh, ferrotitanite, where you have a um, um, matrix and titanium carbide inside um, up to 50, 40 to 50 volume per, uh, percent. So it's really very, very resistant um, compared to other materials. And the last point are precious materials that we have also been looking into, especially in metal injection molding in this case. So that's the materials for bioenergetic. Now, I want to tell you when developing materials for metal bioenergetic, um, the whole process chain has to be taken into account and I will go through every process step that is necessary or crucial um, with its specific futures. So first of all, parts of the printing process or just before the right selection of the binder and that has to be taken or has to be selected according to the material you, you want to print. Um, because there can be some interactions and reactions between the material and the binder, um, or even with the atmosphere. One of the material we are grateful for is uh, yeah, stainless steel. As um, is it not uh, is it not corrosive? It's not corroded by water and air. Is also not um, yeah interacting with the material. So it's really easy material for process development and um, yeah another one that is yeah more crucial um, and that um, it's not that easy is aluminum as aluminum is split in water to hydrogen and oxygen you can't use water-based binders so you have to switch to a solvent-based binder and fine aluminum powder is also explosive or can be explosive. Um, so you should um, print it in an inert atmosphere. That's the first point to the printing process. After printing, it comes the curing. So in, in the curing process, it's the first time the material sees some, yeah, let's say heat 200 degree approximately for a few hours to harm the binder, um, whether it is a, a thermally activated cross-linking process or an ev evaporation process um, of the solvent around some sticky adhesive binder molecules. Um, and also in this case, um, there can be potential reactions of the powder and the atmosphere. Um, on the right hand side, you can see copper um, and there was a real oxidation of the green parts as well as the powder bed. Um, so another atmosphere like argon, for example, could help in this case. So after curing, there comes the depowdering. Um, I guess this is not very crucial for the material development. So we can go over this step and come to debinding and centering. Um, when you have your green parts, um, you have your binder that is yeah, shaping the material and keep the shape. So you want to get this binder out because you won't want some residual of the carbon inside the material. Um, and that's all the tasks for the debinding step. Um, and normally we have a quite fast process um, as we use a binder that um, yeah, fuse out or um, go out of the part really well. Um, so we are quite fast um, and end with 200 minutes at approximately 550 degree. Um, and afterwards there comes the centering. And centering is the process that defines the material property, that creates the material properties. So all the steps before were the shaping process and the centering 
is creating the, the properties uh, out of the powder body. And the most important parameters um, on centering are the centric atmosphere as well as the temperature. Some impression of some Inconel 718 um, results we did in the past um, is that when you center Inconel 718 in the solid state, as you can see on the left hand side, you get parts that are we have that have a quite good density, but um, you will, um, yeah, most of the time you you need some higher centering density. So you increase the temperature and how much liquid trace um, is possible and appropriate to maintain the shape. And there we can see that with increasing temperature, the density increases, but as well the distortion. So. Um, 1290 degree were approximately 40% of um, liquid phase and this was too much for this part to maintain its shape. So for 718 we normally use temperatures between 1260 and 1280 degrees. And then there's the atmosphere and I would say this might even be the more important point compared to the temperature. Um, and the atmosphere has some tasks. First of all, it's a heat transfer. You have to get the heat from the heating elements to the parts. Um, then it also should protect um, the green parts against undesirable reactions like oxidization, decarburization, or carburization. And the yeah, third part is removing products of desirable reactions like debinding, for example. Um, and this can be done with mostly inert atmospheres, um, noble gases like argon or more or less inert nitrogen can be used as well as vacuum. But vacuum um, cannot transfer heat um, above the whole temperature way, uh, range. So there is no convective heat transfer in, um, in vacuum. So heat radiation is the only possibility and this does not really work for low temperatures. As well as removing products um, from the parts, um, this is also not really possible with vacuum to a certain extent. And there are two more tasks of the atmosphere. It's a controlled removal of the yeah, undesirable elements like oxides on the surface of the materials and a controlled introduction of interstitials like nitrogen or carbon, what you may know from case hardening. This, additionally to the first three steps, can be done with the reactive atmospheres. There to mention are mostly hydrogen or endo and exogases. When going to the process atmosphere, we normally use um, first of all there's to mention hydrogen. And then it reduces all oxides on the particle surfaces and, and also strongly decarburizing. Um, the material. So you can't use it for materials with a certain carbon content that you want to keep. So low carbon stainless steels and copper uh, are appropriate materials or hydrogen is the appropriate atmosphere for those two materials. Another atmosphere is nitrogen. It's cheaply and mostly inert um, and is suitable for light low alloy steels as well as um, aluminum. One um, yeah, positive thing about this atmosphere and that's their advantage, they are soluble in the metal lattice. So this gas can go through the material itself. Um, this comes when you have a look on argon and vacuum in contrast. Those 
atmosphere are mainly used for all other materials um, or especially materials that need to be protected um, or there are reactions, um, for example, between titanium and hydrogen um, or tool steels that contain um, a certain alloying element um, and nitrogen, as I want to show you later on. So where is, well, why is there such a slash between argon and vacuum? As argon is not soluble in the metal latches, um, when you reach um, the state of close porosity, the gas stays inside the part um, and it's developing uh, some pressure that is inside the pores and the pores create that pressure until um, the pressure is so high that it prevents further densification. So one option is to go to vacuum, especially when it comes to higher temperatures, so you can do the rebinding in argon and then switch of about yeah, 700, 1800 degree when the heat radiation takes over um, to vacuum. Um, but you can't center all materials in high vacuum because like an example in 174pH, you have elements that have a high vapor pressure and then ca they can evaporate from the metal matrix. So if you have these kind of materials, partial pressure can be an option, um, but partial pressure is also um, possible for the other two gases I already mentioned. So that's for the sintering and for the, um, yeah. Now I want to come to the next part of my presentation, material development or process development for A11 tool steel. Just a quick motivation in the beginning. Um, our goal was to print a capsule by our additive manufacturing um, consisting of a rear resistant material and fill it with a ductile core that or ductile powder and hip it so that you get the best properties out of both materials. Um, in the beginning, we started with laser beam melting, about laser beam melting, and yeah, a lot of carbon um, results in a cracking material. So this was not the suitable process for this material. So we started working on it with binding jetting. As this material does not have a um, stainless matrix, um, it is oxidizing in the curing process, especially in the beginning when we used a water-based binder. So the depowering came, yeah, became um, difficult and we also had some higher oxygen content, as you can see in the left corner, in the sintered parts. When we cured this part in argon, um, we got a lower oxygen content in the sintering parts, as well as a higher sintering density, and the depowdering was possible as usual. Afterwards, we, yeah, we developed the sintering parameter and we take an approach of, of nitrogen as most of the steels, as yeah, low alloy steels where the matrix um, was out of, um, were sintered in nitrogen, we first switched to nitrogen. And nitrogen had a really low sintering temperature and a sol uh, and solidus temperature. So we tried the first sintering in a solid, uh, in a solid state and um, we did not get close porosity, so solid state sintering in nitrogen was not suitable for, for this material. So we switched, first of all, we switched to a second, we switched to liquid phase sintering. So we um, 
raised the temperature of about 20 to 30 degrees and reached almost full density um, with this material. But as we went to the liquid phase, there were also some other reactions. Um, we had some liquid phase, and you may see um, in the liquid phase there was um, majorly some higher chromium content as well as um, manganese. And the nitrogen inserted itself into the um, vanadium carbides. You can see that clearer on the next slide where we have um, the vanadium carbide and see that there was an extended institution of nitrogen inside. Um, yeah. And there, so, um, yeah, second, there was some liquid phase, and the liquid phase um, had a higher tronium, carbon, and vanadium content than the solid state. So we were not still, or we were not homogeneous um, when we centered in the liquid phase and in nitrogen, in nitrogen especially. So nitrogen was not the appropriate atmosphere for this material and we switched over to center and partial pressure of argon. But as already mentioned, we got some closed porosity while still having some argon inside the green parts or brown parts and this um, so further densification wasn't possible. So after the first trials, we switched to high vacuum and we could reach almost or we could reach full density as, as you can say it so, um, with this material. And when we went to the micro section and did the um, SEM samples, we did not see any um, changed um, microstructure and element distribution compared to the base material. So that was a really desirable atmosphere for us. And um, as we were dense, it was perfect um, for this material and for this parameter setup. It, the vanadium carbide had a yeah, really lower content of nitrogen. Um, which was from the base material and the matrix material had all the same chemical composition. After getting the right um, process parameters, we printed and sintered the whole extrusion through. Um, the, um, yeah, the powdering was pretty hard as we just had one hole to get the pressure air inside and the power out. Um, but after the first trial, um, we, we got it undamaged. And the sintering went pretty well. There might be some distortion on the lower um, extent, on the lower part. But as we had complete close porosity and full density, there's a lot of, there's enough potential to reduce sintering time as well as the temperature to be, yeah, to maintain the shape a little bit better. So that's the part of tool steel A11. And now I want to come to another point as Sebastian is presenting more sinter based AM processes. How transferable are the results you get in one of these processes? So first of all, we start with powder and binder. It's not always the same powder and not the same binder, um, but the powder particle size distribution should be suitable for sintering. So it is in the same range, let's say so. Then they come shaping, second, the shaping process. And there's a difference between all center-based AM processes. 
there's a different shaping process process that um, needs different feedstock or powder and vinyl properties. So on F we have different um, binder or feedstock properties. We need the different debinding step, but the sintering step will mostly be the same here. So if you go into that into more detail, um, we have different processes and binder jetting is one of the process that needs little binder compared to, for example, fused filament fabrication, feedstock printing, um, or screen printing. Um, and with more binder inside, you need to get this binder out as well to um, have a residual free decomposition of it. So some of the materials require a solvent debinding step before the thermal debinding. In most of, or in some cases, also the closed porosity um, can be debinded thermically, but it will take a lot of time. So the material development or the process development is, is um, transferable um, when we're starting with the sintering process, as there is just the powder that has a certain shape and that was shaped by the processes. Afterwards, the, um, the sintering behavior of these materials, um, except for the PSD, um, is largely the same. So the findings of the sintering uh, are transferred by, by a large extent. And now I will come to my conclusions. As already mentioned in the beginning, metal binder jetting can process a wide range of materials, especially materials that cannot be processed with other AM methods. And there's one of its benefits. Um, when developing materials for metal binder jetting, um, interactions of the material binder and the atmosphere has to be taken into account, especially the sintering conditions um, are largely determined by the material and they are determining the part properties afterwards. And the transferability of the findings um, is possible to other processes. Now, what are we doing and offering you um, in material and process development? Um, we come from the from the back end side of the process and, and see how is the power centering without, without the shaping process in the beginning. And then we, we, uh, we can see what particle size is suitable um, for the material. Um, and afterwards, we went back or we go back to the first step. Um, and as Klaus already mentioned, powder, powder characterization is crucial for it. Um, and we have a lot of um, processes for it. Afterwards, they come the binder and particle interactions as some binder and powder combinations lead to e particle ejections through the printing process. Um, and you can get some um, inhomogeneous green parts and you can see that also in the sintering process later. So um, a homogeneous green part is desirable. After printing and curing, you have to be binding step and you have to get the binder out of the material. So the interactions between the binding components and the material um, needs to be understood in detail, um, especially for crucial or um, yeah, materials that are really effective to carbon and, and oxygen. So in simultaneous thermal analysis with a mass spectrometry can help there. 
Then afterwards, as already mentioned, there comes the centering that is yeah, just creating the property. So this is one of the most important steps. So thanks for your attention and um, hopefully we can present some pressed, hot isothetic pressed um, capsules um, at our center-based additive manufacturing workshop and we can present it to you. So hope to see you there. Okay, okay, thank you, thank Bastian, you Bastian, for this very nice, very nice presentation. presentation. Bastian, Bastian, there are some questions for you as well, but I have to select again some of the questions. So I would like to start with the question, uh, well, is the same material which you can process with metal injection molding and metal binder, do we get, do we get the get same sintering process or is there some difference? Well, I would say there is a difference. Um, and the difference is in the powder compact or in the green part. The different sintering or sinter based AM processes um, have a different powder load or powder packing, packing in their sintered state. So when we go to the sintering, we have a different number of contact points between the particles and MIM features normally a higher green part density, so you can use um, lower centering temperatures and get an appropriate um, identification. So for binary jetting or other center-based AM process, you might need higher temperatures and yeah, there is some, some point that will, will affect it, let's say so. Okay, another question related to tool steels. Are tool steels, why are they not possible to manufacture using other AM technologies? Well, not other AM technologies in general, um, but some of them, especially laser beam melting, because um, there is a lot of carbon in, inside, and carbon, when you cool down, steel with a higher carbon content, there is some margin size and margin size has a different density. It has a lower density. So um, there is some some thermal. Yeah, there's some some residual stress inside the part and the residual stress um, is getting too big, too large. Um, there will be some cracks as seen in the picture. But other center based AM processes or maybe electron beam melting that has a really high um, temperature inside the build chamber um, are suitable for those materials. Okay, um, maybe I can open one more question and this is related to hot isostatic pressing. So what is your comment on hot isostatic pressing? Can it be used for binder jetting? Yes, it can be used. As you uh, could see, we reach, um, or in most of the cases, we get reach a close porosity, and that's the point that you need for hot static community close porosity. And we can reach those close porosity um, in most or every case, I would say so. So hot isostatic pressing is suitable for binary jetted parts. Bastian, there are some more questions related to other materials. So one of those materials is magnesium. What is your comment for magnesium? Well, it's difficult to, to process aluminum because um, there have to be some, yeah, some, some safety has to be taken into account. And magnesium is even more crucial as it is lighter and um, more exposed. So, um, I would take care of, of having those materials in my printer and if I can um, can leave it off my printer, I would in this case. <laughs> okay, I, can, I agree to your opinion. Um, so avoid magnesium powder as good as possible. So 
At least for binary jetting. Yeah, especially for binary jetting. Okay, so unfortunately, I guess we cannot address more questions right now. I would once more like to encourage all of you who are not uh, really getting their answers right now to all the questions coming in here. So to contact us directly and we will be more than happy to react and to answer all your questions later on. So um, I would like to switch over now to our third presentation and the third presentation will be given by uh, Sebastian Hein. Sebastian is uh, dealing with the, the other center based additive manufacturing processes uh, which we have aside from binary jetting. Sebastian. Thank you, Frank, for the introduction and uh, Klaus and Basti for the presentations. Um, with a one eye on the clock, um, I will have to uh, hurry a little uh, through my slides. I'm sorry to say so. So I will also say that if you have any questions, um, either because I have to, uh, you know, speed through these slides or because I uh, they concern um, processes that I do not show here because uh, there are too many to show in this short time, please contact us, uh, don't hesitate, just uh, get into contact with us. So my plan is to um, tell you what processes we have uh, in IFAM, in Bremen and in Dresden mainly, and go into some detail on the three processes you see mentioned here, and then uh, conclude my presentation. So similar to the slide that Klaus showed earlier, uh, you can see that um, we have mainly binder uh, or sinter based AM methods in house, um, but also um, the laser and electron uh, beam processes. Um, you can see, uh, um, for example, um, these uh, base uh, binder jetting is, is a very strong focus of ours, as you uh, can, can gather from the previous presentations, but also um, 3D printing, uh, screen printing and the others mentioned here. And when I um, just very quickly um, tell about the uh, different approaches uh, approaches for these processes, um, as Bastian mentioned, um, basically the difference is in the in the green part build up and the related powders and, and binder um, approaches that are suitable. Um, where binder jetting makes use of, of the free flowing powder and printing the binder into the bed. Um, the fused filament fabrication um, deposits, uh, deposits um, a feedstock, basically a thermoplastic material with a high powder load um, onto um, uh, the print bed, um, the print plate, basically. 3D screen printing makes use of a, of a powder filled paste, um, which is pushed through a screen um, at the um, spots where the screen has its, uh, let's say, spaces for the paste to, to fit through. Mold jet is a very similar process, but it does not make use of um, screens, but um, you basically build up the mold of a, of a um, wax-like material um, layer by layer and just uh, spread the paste into these uh, yeah, spaces that you leave out. Gel casting is uh, using um, previously 3D printed molds, um, which are then filled with a metal powder filled slurry. Um, and a very interesting process I will come to later is the freeform uh, metal injection molding, I call it here. So it's um, combining injection or MIM um, with, a, um, with removal uh, mode inserts that are also 3D printed. And um, the latest addition um, to our uh, um, processes in uh, Dresden in this case um, is the lithography um, based metal manufacturing, which is a localized polymerization of a um, yeah, metal powder filled resin or paste in this case. But of course, there are also other processes um, like uh, selective laser sintering with um, plastic coated or polymer coated metal powders or layered, layered powder metallurgy by stratasys or um, pellet based extrusion uh, processes that, um, for example, from, like from AIM 3D. And um, there are a more, uh, yeah, occurring um, nearly daily, so it's very hard to keep track of them and we of course try to uh, to uh, address all that uh, the ones that we see have a potential uh, from our point of view. And um, these three uh, red highlighted uh, processes are the ones that I will describe a little more in detail in the following, starting with a um, FFF process, fused filament fabrication. Uh, in our case, not as you may know it from your home or from, um, well, it's actually one of the most known, I think the most known um, 
uh, 3D printing process also uh, for, for uh, persons not really involved in manufacturing. So uh, you can buy cheap printers for home uh, um, purposes and use uh, plastic filaments to print. And uh, so we don't use these plastic filaments, but of course, powder filled um, feedstock filaments. Um, of course, those have to be able to be processed um, in this manner, um, which is not um, always possible with the feedstock, for example, used for uh, metal injection molding. But other than that, um, you print the part um, and also have a debinding uh, and sintering step, um, as was shown also pre previously. Here you can see some sample parts, um, not only metal ones, uh, but uh, mainly stainless steel as it's the, the workhorse for development um, as, as basically of all processes. Um, you can see uh, some parts of uh, medical uh, technology relevant materials like uh, TIE 64 or some uh, metal ceramic composites, which uh, in this case you cannot see, but those parts are actually hollow and uh, have an um, internal support structure, which is uh, very interesting and uh, one of the main I think fascinating features that uh, this process can uh, um, sh uh, shows. And um, another topic that we used to look in, uh, used to look into is uh, ceramics and mainly bioceramics, as you can see on the lower right part, which is a high, um, yeah, yeah, basically hydroxyapatite based material. And some process aspects um, and um, well materials. Um, so the fused filament fabrication is an extrusion based printing process and th there are many of those actually um, the very early ones like uh, bioplotting and robocasting that mainly make use of slurries. Um, then there's of course the filament based printing which uh, but can also be a kind of uh, a rod um, that uh, perhaps when it's more stiff has to be adapted um, printer wise uh, to be able to use rods that are more stiff than filaments and as mentioned before also granular material may be used uh, for example in this yeah, granular printing um, processes and um, these different processes they may make use of different solidification um, yeah processes um, for example, in, in when we melt the material and it uh, cools down, it's a, it's a liquid to solid well, phase transition or uh, um, a physical uh, process, but also a chemical process may be used like a precipitation or a real chemical reactions when you print, for example, into a certain solution that changes pH and um, material con con uh, really becomes, um, yeah. Uh, hardened uh, to some extent. So this is basically what's done for many scaffold materials. Um, for FFF, when you adapt, uh, when you want to make this um, thermoplastic based approach, you have to ad adapt the feedstock um, that it can be used as filament and is not too brittle. Um, as you can see on the lower right side, um, what we uh, have a, as a know-how in-house is uh, to basically, basically Pro, make the process in a way that you prevent this, this special kind of porosity that comes from this strand deposition of the process. And um, as I mentioned earlier, these hollow parts are really an interesting uh, feasible structure that can barely made, uh, be made with any other um, processes. And on the upper right, you see a small table with uh, materials that um, we have been looking into uh, mainly on uh, ourselves. And um, yeah, this is very, uh, interesting to see in which direction this can go material wise. Um, so if you have any, yeah, any questions there or interests, please contact us. Next, I want to go to the free form metal injection molding process. I guess this is less known than the FFF. Um, the MIM process, as probably many of you will know, starts with um, making a feedstock by combining powder and binder mixing it into this feedstock and then injection molding uh, the part into a green part form and um, then have the binding and sintering and the um, freeform mim basically comes in before you uh, make the green part because uh, what you do um, additionally is that you print a part uh, in this case by uh, making use of direct light uh, processing uh, so it's a uh, um, lithography based um, printing of a, of a polymer part and with a very special uh, kind of resin. Then this part fits into a base mold, um, as you can see on the upper right side, and um, the feedstock uh, in the uh, injection molding step gets injected into the space that is available by this 
green part uh, by, by this sorry by this printed part and um, it's this this printed material can be removed chemically by a hydrolyzation step and uh, removal of the um, hydrolyzation products and then you basically have your your green part which goes back into this standard process chain by um, of the binding and sintering mm, it's it's a relatively new process so there are not that many examples yet um, so you can see um, our work uh, on the stainless steel on the left um, where you can see some of these printed uh, mold inserts um, you can see the shadows of the of the nut and bolts and um, beside that um, the green parts and the on the top and the, and the bottom uh, sintered parts of nut and bolt and uh, we also looked into um, other um, yeah geometries in this case and on the right side you can see some examples with uh, ceramic materials um, that were done by our colleagues from ikts and um, yeah we see a very interesting uh, process there um, some aspects I want to uh, share are that we have, we have a very, very accurate translation of the of the print part features into the um, green part the, the, of the feedstock. So really, this this print part quality is is what mainly determines your your center part quality in the end. Um, I don't want to hide some challenges. So um, the base, uh, main ones we see in the um, removal of the printed part. So your feedstock has to um, has some characteristics, some uh, strength that it uh, withstands um, some swelling of the material. Um, this this printed part that may occur. Um, you have to uh, prevent some well interaction uh, with this demolding agent. Um, and you have for uh, especially for the metal parts you have to make sure that you remove this printed material completely as it's an acrylic material and those are not nice to burn out and uh, may leave uh, residual material that uh, disturbs the sintering of your material or adds carbon uh, for example and um, changes the material um, for the, the binding and sintering um, i would say that it's mainly the same as uh, for mim so um, this has been not a, a great issue and we can focus on these uh, other um, points we see some potential especially it's interesting uh, for low volume part production um, and when you come from the mim uh, um, side that you can make use of your production uh, material for um, yeah for uh, prototypes and, and small series parts um, you have a very high uh, fast um, time to market when you make uh, design iterations, for example, parallel to a uh, classic mold production uh, when you look at the MIM process. Uh, but you may also make higher complex parts than you can with MIM because you have you don't have to to pre, uh, to make um, this, this demolding by opening a tool and ejecting a part. So you have, are more free there in the complexity. Um, a nice feature that you can integrate is um, what we looked in, into um, in the past is tagging of parts uh, with, for example, um, data matrix codes. And um, this could be directly implemented in any in all the, the printed um, molds. So this is a very interesting feature for also keeping track of parts. Uh, the third process um, I want to very quickly show is the lithography based metal manufacturing or LMM process. This, as I mentioned, the the latest addition to our um, yeah, facility in, in, in Dresden in this case, and you can see that it's a little different um, from, from uh, perhaps what you know from the ceramic field um, uh, LCM process. So you have a feedstock um, which is more like a butter-like uh, paste, and you you um, with a with a blade um, you pull it over and onto your building platform um, where you um, put a, a beam of light um, by a DLP uh, engine onto your part and where the the, the um, well the white pixels hit the material um, it the chemical reaction will occur and where the uh, um, light or the, the picture is black um, the material won't harden so it's the same process as the DLP printing from this perspective and uh, then you can lower the um, platform and um, add the next layer and um, thus build up your parts as you can can see on the right side um, making uh, printed parts and then have the, basically the same post processing by debinding and sintering you can see some examples so um, thanks to incos we have some very nice pictures of of these parts that you can see here and it's really like a very um, very precise method a very high resolution um, because you can use the light um, as a source for for uh, hardening your material 
And um, this makes it very interesting um, for very small parts, mainly. Um, uh, you seldomly have to use um, support structures. Um, the resolution is, as I said, quite high, but um, the process is still rather slow. And maybe this is a, um, that it's why it's why it's mainly suitable for small parts. Um, the build volume is also not that large, so it's, in order to get this high resolution, you have to focus the uh, this this picture that you get, um, make uh, on a very small um, surface area, so that you can make use of of the higher resolution. And um, yeah, some other features mentioned here with a uh, look on the clock. I will hasten up uh, once more a little. Um, you can try to compare um, the different AM processes, um, which uh, I won't go into detail here, but as you can see, it, we are also concerned with looking at what is the right choice of process that you need and um, can compare them to some extent, um, not not generally, but, but always with a focus on a certain material part or powder. Um, and um, I think uh, this is, gives us a very good overview about all these AM technologies um, uh, for metal parts and um, if you want to discuss what may be suitable to for you then uh, we are also there to um, discuss this um, as far um, Klaus always uh, also said we are um, working on different um, aspects and we want to understand the these processes and the, and the process change and their uh, inter uh, dependencies uh, from the powder to the part and um, do everything basically along the um, process chain um, perhaps, perhaps except for making our own powders, but um, everything else is really um, in our scope. Um, so feel free to contact us for any of those. And with this um, and uh, the, I think, fourth mentioning of our workshop uh, in September, I want to uh, thank you for your attention and close my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, for this very nice talk. I followed a little bit the question answer session here. And uh, as you can imagine, there are also some questions coming in for you, but you are in the lucky position that you answered some of the questions already during your talk. And especially with your table, which was a very busy table, you answered a lot of the questions coming in. So for example, okay. uh, maybe you can give a comment on the best choice if you want to have uh, good surface quality. Yes, so I mean, well, let's say we look at AM processes, um, um, leaving out uh, mold-based processes because, of course, molds can be made uh, very, very uh, nicely um, with um, subtractive methods in terms of the surface quality. But um, the, the best surface quality is, is achieved when you can make use of some light source um, for your part production. So basically, uh, this uh, DLP process is very nice because you can make pixels like uh, around 10 micrometers in, in size that um, define the part property. So I think um, the best surfaces you can get with this uh, freeform injection molding and the LMM process in, in general. But of course, the powder plays a very vital role in this. Also, if, the, if your powder particles are relatively big and compared to your resolution of the um, of the of the yeah part that you can produce, then of course this will also affect the surface quality. Um, but this would be my answer. Okay, this was a very long answer. Sorry, yeah. that's okay. But uh, well, maybe one short answer. Do you see one or more of these technologies you mentioned uh, having lower hurdles in investment? Yeah, I mean, the uh, cheapest investments are seen in, in the FFF process for the printers. But of course, as we talk about cinder based AM, we always have the debinding and sintering in the end. So um, it's mainly suitable for uh, working together with people um, who have these uh, facilities or these uh, technical um, yeah, possibilities or if you have those uh, for yourselves. But just from the printing, the cheapest one will definitely be the fused filament fabrication these days. OK, so uh, I guess the time is running very quickly. So we have exactly three o'clock, which is uh, more or less the end of our session for today. So I would like to thank all of you uh, for your presentations and also for all of you participating here. So um, especially for your discussion, and I hope that we can continue our discussion with most of you in the near future.
And if I say in the near future, I would once again uh, stress our workshop, which we are planning in September. We have in September the 15th and 16th a workshop on center-based additive manufacturing, our second workshop on that topic. And what is not mentioned here, we will also have a tutorial again. We plan a tutorial for those of you who might be interested in learning more basics and maybe also more details of the technologies. Uh, please check frequently our homepage. You see the QR code here. We will also share the um, well, direct access to the homepage where this workshop is addressed. You can see our program, which is already set. And uh, hopefully we will meet in September with most of you in person. I hope that the situation will improve globally so that we can travel again and meet in person. Uh, if this should not be possible, we have uh, plan B and this plan B is a hybrid. Uh, workshop where we have, as today, some virtual event combined with a local event. So thank you for attending today and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.